everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We hope you are all well and safe. It is, of course, a busy time of year for producers. Agriculture doesn't stop, so we're bringing you the information you count on, at a safe distance, of course, beginning with an update on Oklahoma's wheat crop with our Extension Small Grain Specialist, Dr. Amanda Silva. The wheat's looking good overall. We have been really wet and uh, warmer than usual. So wheat's growing and it's growing fast. So we have uh, wheat uh, development ranging from jointing up to heading, like here in this trial that we planted uh, mid-September, it's the wheat's already heading, and, but it's, it's looking good. Yeah, it's really coming along as we can see. Yes. Um, we are hearing reports of disease pressure around the state. Get us up to speed on that. Yeah, so we have uh, been hearing about uh, some leaf spotting diseases in no-till wheat in the southern part of Oklahoma. I've also found some uh, striped rust disease, as you can see here, it's a bright orange uh, spores in the leaf and it follows like the vein, so you can tell this is a striped rust. I've also heard about uh, reports of leaf, uh, leaf rust in Texas, so with all this uh, wetness, uh, we should be uh, scouting for, for rust diseases this time of the year. Let's talk about the weather for a minute. Uh, we've already had temperatures in some areas uh, top out at around 90 degrees, but we're not out of the woods yet in terms of a spring freeze. Yeah, so there is still a probability of spring freeze events. And as the wheat uh, is in this time of the stage moving from jointing to heading and anthesis, uh, it gets more uh, susceptible to freeze temperatures. So we need to, to keep uh, our look in those below freezing temperatures and because some damage can still occur. This is the time of year when there are quite a few extension field days, but of course those have been postponed, but you and your colleagues are working to get those online. Yes, so OSU has canceled all wheat field days uh, through May 10th, and uh, we are working on alternatives to get that information out for producers. So we will come back with more information about that soon. Okay, great. We'll look forward to that and, of course, pass it along to all of our viewers. Amanda, thanks a lot, and we'll see you again soon. Winter crops are continuing to grow across the state, and Josh, where are we with the crops? David, it actually looks really good um, from, from where we are now to where we are three weeks ago. Uh, not only, especially with our wheat, do our markets look better, but both the wheat and the canola and a lot of our winter pastures, cover crops, all those kind of things, they look outstanding. These, these warmer temperatures, all this rain have kind of helped. There are still parts of the state, namely the western parts into the panhandle that are still struggling with a little bit of dryness. We're starting to hear things of a couple of fields, uh, either uh, thinking about being terminated or zeroed out. However, for the bulk majority of the rest of the state, we look fairly good. While, while a lot of the focus is on the winter crops that are coming up right now, we're gonna be getting into summer planting season soon. Yeah, we're already there. Uh, corn needs to, uh, folks that are doing corn need to either be going in the ground or be thinking about going in the ground. Soil temperatures are there. Uh, a quick look at Mesonet, you, you see that most of the three-day soil temperatures are well into the 50s. Some, some folks around the state are seen in the 60s. Uh, and so we, we are in that situation where we can start putting winter crops in the ground. Uh, there's still some caution with some of the things like grain sorghum, soybeans. Uh, if we do get a little cold, which we are forecasted to, to, to see these little periodic cold snaps, uh, might not be the best for those crops. Corn does, does absolutely fine in it. If, if you're planning on planting corn, get corn in the ground. It's a great time. Time, great moisture to go into the ground, good heat that should start roaring out of the ground. But in a, in a wet spring like this, uh, in, in, in all of our crops, weeds are probably going to once again be our number one priority. And, and we don't have to look back too far. If you just look at last year, weeds were a 
big thing. And so growers need to go out there and make sure we start clean, get everything cleaned up. Uh, a, a good burn down like we have behind us is not a, a you know, something to where we don't have to put a pre down once again especially with how wet we are and how warm we're getting weeds are going to start germinating very quickly so we need to be very proactive in our burn down and our pre-emergence programs especially as we're starting to put summer crops in you did mention how wet we've been i mean usually this ditch we were able to walk across and, and then there's been a, a lot of times lately that there's roaring water through here what what should producers be thinking about if they cannot get in their fields to plant because it has been too wet? I mean, Oklahoma is a diverse state whenever it comes to moisture conditions. Yeah, and so the, there there are a lot of decisions. Like I said, the western part of the state, specifically out in, in the western side of Texas County, Cimarron County is still going through a really bad drought scenario. Um, still still have to start wondering about what you're going to do. And, and there is there is a lot of folks that have that short memory that, that remember what we went through last summer and, and maybe don't want to go to that summer crop because they, they are a little low on soil moisture or maybe they remember how bad it can get so there, there are places that aren't experiencing this um, I mean patiently wait I mean we're gonna need the moisture uh, if you have something in the ground and you're gonna zero it out start getting really good options remember what herbicides you put out herbicide restrictions um, you know that kind of thing we just got to plan at that point the one thing I will caution is seeds seed local seed supplies are really short whether that be because of COVID and the trucks not, not coming locally, or whether that be because of, of just lower seed uh, storage, well, like we see in sorghum, because we haven't seen the mass amount of sorghum in the state. We, if, you're, if you're still looking to plant summer crops, getting your seed pretty quickly is gonna be very, very critical because we need to get good quality seed, not just what's left over at the end. And a lot of our companies still have really nice quality seed. We need to go out and get that and be proactive because you know, in as little as a week, we could be planting quite a bit of our summer crops if, if the rains fall just right and the temperatures fall just right. So once again, being proactive now with things that we can't do in the field or, or help us uh, kind of shorten that planting window down if, if need be. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Dr. You. Josh Lofton, Cropping System Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. The coronavirus has caused a tremendous upheaval in all markets, especially beef markets. So Daryl, let's start with wholesale and retail beef markets. You know, about two weeks ago when it became apparent that we were going to severely restrict movement, shut down a lot of things, restaurants closing. And so we saw an immediate impact at the grocery stores, of course. Folks started stocking up, a little bit of panic buying, so buying more than usual. And what we saw was that, of course, grocery stores to this day still are having trouble maintaining product on the shelves. And of course, you have to keep in mind that, that you know, normally we send about half of our meat through uh, food service, restaurant type trade, and the other half through grocery stores. Now we're trying to do the vast majority of it through one of those two channels. So we've got these real bottlenecks. And as a result, we've seen a big spike up in boxed beef prices. They're starting to come back down. After a couple of weeks, we can eventually kind of get in front of this bottleneck and, uh, and, and, and work through this. We don't have a shortage of meat, just uh, some problems getting it where it needs to be. So how have fed cattle markets been faring so far? Well, you know, if you go back to February, when the coronavirus thing really started to take off, became apparent we were gonna have issues around the world and in the US, and the stock market started falling, the cattle markets, especially the futures markets, really tend to follow those. Uh, you know, cattle prices dropped significantly until this last week, and in response to the wholesale beef demand, uh, packers have uh, ramped up production. And so we saw a pretty good spike back up almost to uh, the February levels in these fed cattle prices. You know, in the feeder cattle markets, of course, when this thing started, we were bringing cattle off a of wheat pasture. Uh, and so some producers got caught. Uh, the feeder cattle markets generally, especially the futures markets, followed the, the fed cattle down along with the stock market. And eventually that weighed heavily on the cash markets as well. So we had one pretty good week the first week of March, but then after that, prices dropped pretty sharply on the cash market. 
and auction volumes really drop. It seems like every day something's changing, but where, what do you expect going forward if you can make a prediction at all? Well, again, we don't have any shortage of cattle or beef and so on. We're just trying to work through these logistics. So, um, you know, uh, feeder cattle markets, depending on where you are in the chain, we've got a little more flexibility. If we've got calves on the ground right now, um, you know, we've probably got time to uh, price those later and, and hopefully this thing works its way mostly past. Uh, you know, I think we'll get through this and, and uh, certainly get the beef market kind of straightened back out here. Yeah, well, hopefully next time we talk, things will be going better. All right, thanks, Daryl. Dr. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Several weeks ago on the Cow-Calf Corner, we visited with you about the need to have bulls passing a breeding soundness exam by your local veterinarian. But that's only part of the pre-breeding season bull management that I think is pretty important. So now's the time to make sure that our bull battery is ready to go. First of all, how many bulls do we need? And that's always a real tough question to answer because there's so much variability in bulls and their ability to get a number of cows bred. With young bulls, I use a, a pretty conservative rule of thumb. If that's a, a yearling bull that we've just recently purchased and he's only 12 to 14 months of age, then that's about the maximum number of females that I would put to, with him in the breeding pasture. In other words, match the number of females with his months in age. So if he's uh, 12 months old, only 10 to 12 females is about what we'd use. If it's a fall-born bull that now is 18 months of age, then of course I think we'd go a little bit higher in terms of that number, or around uh, 15 to 18 females. Mature bulls that we know something about, then obviously uh, in a lot of cases, we'll use a, a rather conservative number of 25 cows per bull, and some bulls we know can certainly do much better than that, going as high as 25, 30, 35. I wouldn't go much uh, farther on the cow to bull ratio than that. When we're using these very young bulls and they've been recently purchased, find out what the previous owner has been feeding the bull and then let's reduce the amount of grain gradually, week by week, so that he's uh, eventually on a full forage diet by the start of the breeding season. I think you'll be much uh, more pleased with results by doing that. Certainly, if we're going to have more than one bull in our breeding pasture, we want to remember they're going to socially decide who's king of the mountain. Let's make sure that we've got those bulls together for several weeks prior to the breeding season so that they get the fighting over with and they're not doing that during the first part of the breeding season when we'd like to have their attention on getting cows bred rather than fighting each other. I think we'll use some common sense in this last month or so before the breeding season we can help, help ourselves by doing a good job with the bull management and therefore a little higher percentage calf crop, more calves to sell the following fall. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SunUp's Cow-Calf Corner. Now a word from Dr. Rosalind Biggs, our Extension Beef Cattle Veterinarian, with some health and safety steps you can take during this time if you've been working around animals. As far as, as animals and humans, um, we, we generally recommend in their biosecurity uh, really at all times, regardless of whether uh, we're under a COVID-19 situation or, or otherwise, because good biosecurity is, um, is good biosecurity at, at any time. And so, you know, you will see enhanced biosecurity precautions as far as um, for many veterinarians, if they're taking in, taking in an animal into the hospital. So you may see those that are wearing, wearing gowns and masks and gloves. Again, it's that social distancing piece, that separation piece uh, recommended by the CDC in order to take those animals on into the hospital. You know, from, a, from an owner standpoint, we still recommend our general biosecurity uh, practices uh, for for any disease, um, particularly animal disease, that we're not wanting to to spread uh, set, spread illness uh, from group to group. There's been no evidence right now that animals can spread 
uh, spread the virus, COVID-19, to humans. And so now there is, uh, there are recommendations on the CDC's website, as well as through the American Veterinary Medical Association. Uh, for those that are uh, confirmed with infection, humans confirmed with infection of, of COVID-19, that they take uh, certain precautions in, in dealing with their pets. And, um, you know, because we still have a lot to learn about this virus um, as, a, in an, as an entire medical community. And so, you know, we would encourage those uh, people that have concerns to take a little extra time, visit that CDC website, read those resources available. But at this point, we don't have any indication that animals can spread the virus to humans. We understand the value of, of animals um, to their owners, and uh, we want to make sure we're able to continue that assistance uh, to, to animal owners uh, across the state. We're talking soil aeration right now, and Alex, what exactly is soil aeration? So soil aeration, it's pretty much when you use aerators. Uh, that's it's pretty much an implement for disrupting the soil crust that may form, soil compaction, in the two, three, no more than four inches uh, in the soil. So that's pretty much what soil aeration is. So when would producers, you know, think about, you know, doing this process? Would it be in the spring or the summer? That's a good question. Uh, I, I would like to say that keep in mind that soil aeration is just good when you have a soil compaction. Uh, when your soil really has a crust and any, no plants can grow from that crust, that's when we can justify a soil aeration. Now, here in Oklahoma, our main problems with pastures is not soil compaction. The main problems that we have is fertilization. So I would tell to a producer that's thinking about soil aeration, first of all, go to your field and just try to dig a hole that's no more than six inches deep and see if you have that crust in the top layer. If there is that crust there, well, that will justify a soil aeration. If you have a Bermuda grass pasture, I would say the best time for we go there and do a soil aeration would be June especially mid of June, because that's the time that the Bermuda grass is growing aggressively. So as soon as you disrupt that soil, the Bermuda grass can grow and fill those gaps. Is there any, uh, you know, in regards to the amount of rainfall that a certain area has got, does that factor in at all? Yes, yes, uh, especially now that we have uh, soils that are pretty wet. I don't believe that the soil aeration will do pretty well. It's going to be very difficult to make this equipment pass through and do a good job there. The soil aeration must be combined with good practice, good fertilization, proper stock rate, and the pasture rotation, so you can make the most of the pasture. All right, thanks, Alex. If you'd like some more information on soil aeration, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. We are joined now by Brian Arnell, our Extension Precision Nutrient Management Specialist. Brian, we're seeing some yellow wheat around the state. Let's talk about that right off the bat. Yeah, so the yellowing going around the state, uh, a fair amount is due to nitrogen. I'll address that, but there's a lot of things happening in our wheat crop right now. A lot of disease, a lot of abiotic stresses. So just because of wheat yellow doesn't mean it's due to nitrogen, absolutely. But there's a lot of nitrogen deficiency going out in the state right now. Uh, a couple reasons uh, for that. One is we just look at the rainfall totals for the last uh, 60 to 90 days. We've had a significant amount of rain, uh, anywhere between 6 to 10 inches, depending on where you're at in the state. You have some examples for us. Tell us what we're seeing here. Okay, so what we're seeing here is a couple of things. We see uh, yellowing on the lower and older leaves. That's a sign of nitrogen deficiencies when you have a green top up. Uh, green plants up top, uh, yellow leaves down below, that's a good symptomology of nitrogen deficiency because it starts, nitrogen can relocate from the older leaves to the newer leaves so you see the deficiency down low. 
One of the reasons I think we're seeing a lot of nitrogen deficiency, even though nitrogen has been applied, is that almost everywhere I go throughout the state, I'm seeing pretty shallow roots. So our rainfall pattern this year has allowed the wheat just to kind of maintain itself in the top couple inches, and it's not exploring down to depth. So with our recent rainfalls moving that nitrate down into the soil profile, we probably just don't have a root system big enough this year that can chase it down. So we're seeing a lot of nitrogen deficiencies even when fields had a fertilizer applied in January and early February. I know you're getting questions from producers. What, what can I do, if anything, and is it too late? Are we too far along in the growing season? Those are great questions and, and a little bit of a complicated question. Uh, the too late will absolutely go back to where's the wheat at in its growth stage. Right here, this wheat I'm holding, we're about one leaf away from seeing the flag leaf fully extended. By that point in time, we've really gotten too late to get much benefit out of anything for nitrogen. From what we've seen in the current research is that if we can get our nitrogen on somewhere between hollow stem, that's when that growing point is above the soil surface, which most of the state is at right now, to a couple weeks afterwards. So somewhere we have about a joint, maybe that heading is about four to six inches above that soil surface, we can get pretty good recovery. So for a good portion of the state, there's still that window of opportunity over the next couple of weeks or yeah, so. There's still that window of opportunity, but make sure your growth stage is out there. Another thing to take uh, keep in mind is the applicator you're using to apply. Once we have that growing point abo above the soil surface, that hollow stem is above the soil surface, whenever you step or drive over the wheat, it will terminate that wheat. It will kill that growing point. So trafficking has to be considered. Okay, well, great conversation today. Thanks for this guidance, and we will see you again soon. For a link to Brian's new blog and more details on what we discussed today, go to sunup.okstate.edu. The USDA released planted acre estimates recently, and Kim, how close were those numbers compared to what the market was expecting? Well, I think there's enough difference there that may cause some impact on the prices. You look at uh, wheat, the USDA came out at uh, 44,655,000 acres. The trade was at 44,000,000. Uh, 982. That's 330,000 less acres than the trade expected. Corn came in 2.66 million acres more than the, the trade expected at 96,990,000 acres. Uh, soybeans came in at uh, 1.36 million acres less than expected at uh, 83 million. 510,000. So I think it's positive for wheat and beans, negative for corn. They also released the quarterly grain stocks also. Was there any news in that? Uh, there wasn't much news for wheat and beans, but I think there is some impact for corn. You had uh, wheat come in at one, uh, 1 1.4 billion. Soybeans came in at uh, 2.25 billion, just right close to trade's expectations. But corn came in 170 million bushels less than expected. That may offset some of those higher acres, but I don't think it'll totally offset it. So what's with all the chatter of higher prices in wheat? Well, the last week, uh, it hadn't been much there. You know, wheat prices it just watered around. Now, buyers of wheat around the world are, are having to uh, pay higher prices than they did uh, two or three weeks ago. But I think what's happened is around the world, people are hoarding bread, pasta, flour, rice. Uh, so you've got the, uh, the bakers, they're in trying to catch up with demand. You've got the millers trying to catch up with demand. And you've, therefore, you've got the, they're buying more wheat and then you're having some problems with transportation. I think it's all in the market right now and the prices are just wallowing around. But you've got other things going in the market like Russia and India are both releasing uh, their, their reserves to try to keep their, their bread prices and their, their flour prices uh, lower for their consumers. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And now here's Dr. Amy Hagerman with information on the passage of the recent economic recovery package. So on Friday, March 27th, Congress signed the CARES Act, which is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act. So about $9.5 billion was set aside for agricultural programs. And, and so our agricultural producers, we don't know exactly what those programs are gonna look like yet or how the signups will work, but the money is going to be there to provide some relief for the impacts that coronavirus has had economically on agriculture. A second pot of money, $14 billion, was set aside to go into the Commodity Credit Corps 
program. This is that pot of money that includes all of our disaster relief like WIP Plus or more recently the market facilitation program. And that funding is a little bit different. It's specifically for fiscal year 20, and it's designed to cover those overages that we would expect to see because of what's happening in our markets right now. So this is really just aid for our agricultural producers, but they would also still be eligible for the individual aid that would come through IRS to households. There's certainly a recognition that we can't wait a long time for some of this aid for our agricultural producers. So I would expect to see some announcements in a pretty short timeline on what the programs will look like and announce the start up of the sign up periods. I don't know how long that sign up period will last at this point because again, they're, they're trying to overcome some hurdles on how to do sign up in an automated process that doesn't include the, the social interaction that it has historically. So uh, I think in the coming weeks, certainly we'll get more details from USDA on exactly how they're going to implement these programs in addition to the details from IRS on how the individual programs and then also the small business programs will be implemented as well. That will do it for our show this week. For more in-depth versions of today's segments, go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash sunuptv. I'm Lyndall Stout. Take care, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.